Okay, it's good to see that you braved the heat and humidity and came out today. And I am going to ask if anybody knows how to turn on that fan, if they would do so. Um, when I was at our, our last church, it was like an inferno in the summer, and I would always ask from the pulpit for them to turn on the fans, and inevitably somebody would get upset with me because they were cold. So anyway, um, if you don't have to turn it on, that's fine. I will survive. Um, Pastor Borden asked me to fill in for him while he was on vacation for one Sunday, so that's why I am here, and uh, we are going to be putting aside the series we've been working on, the uh, Seven Virtues, I think that's what it's called, I can't remember now, yep. <laughs> but anyway, I assume Erica's going to look after that next week. So anyway, today we're going to look at Psalm 73, and I want to read that for you now, so it will, I think it will be on the screen. If not, you can look in your Bibles or on your devices and uh, follow along as I read. So let's hear the word of the Lord. Psalm 73, beginning at verse 1. Thank you for turning on the fan. <laughs> Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? This is what the wicked are like. Always free of care, they go on amassing wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been afflicted, and every morning brings new punishments. If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply, till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. They are like a dream when one awakes. When you arise, Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Yet... I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel and afterward will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You will destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. Well, back in the early 2000s, a Christian children's choir from Africa toured Atlantic Canada singing in many churches. You may, you may have seen them, and unfortunately, I can't remember what they were called. But what stands out for me from that time was not the performance of the choir, although it was excellent, but it was a comment that one of the choir leaders made to our lead pastor. He said, I cannot understand how followers of Jesus can keep their faith when they live in such an ungodly culture as this. And almost 20 years lately, I think we have slid down the slippery slope even more so than that. The culture in which we live here in Canada influences us, influences us greatly as believers. 
We are constantly bombarded by information from many different sources that for the most part is contrary to the truth of God's word. And we are constantly and continually encountering people, encountering people who have a, a very different view on, on life and how to live life than we do as followers of Jesus. Yet Jesus told his disciples that we are to be in the world but not of the world, meaning that we will live in the world as disciples, such as it is, but not to fashion our lives after the world in which we live. We now have the life of Christ, and that is how we are to define the way we live. So how do we, as children of God, live in a culture that is not only non-Christian, but is very quickly becoming anti-Christian. Well, much of it has to do with perspective, which is what we're going to look at today. The psalmist Asaph, who, who is credited with writing Psalm 73, is struggling with ungodliness in his culture, and he's having a crisis of faith. And he is teetering on the edge of the precipice about ready to turn away from God. But before we dig into Asaph and see what he is doing and saying, I just want to say that Psalm 73 is all about perspective. And perspective most simply means point of view. For the Christian, we need to seek God's perspective. That is his point of view about life, about what we believe, the way we think, how we speak, how we act and how we live, especially how we live the life of Christ in a country that is non-Christian. We need God's perspective, his point of view in everything. To seek God's perspective is to seek truth, to find out what God thinks or says or does about life. How do we find God's perspective? We find it in his word and in his presence and by seeking him. There have been times in my life when something unexpected or difficult will happen and my first response is usually an emotional one. But eventually I realize I need something more than my feelings so I will say to God, please give me your perspective. And what I'm really saying to God is help me to see this situation your way from your point of view or help me to respond in your perspective according to your truth and that's what perspective is when i was going to acadia divinity college we were constantly told over and over and over and over again to think theologically and to think, think theologically is simply to seek god's perspective we're not to rely on our own thoughts or the opinions of others or the experiences of others or even our experiences but first to seek God's point of view, his perspective, his truth. In Psalm 73, as we're going to see in a minute, Asaph was looking at life himself and his circumstances from his own point of view, his perspective. He got so focused on himself and his problems that he lost sight of his relationship with the Lord and the blessings and promises of God. When we lose our focus and, our, and allow our eyes to glance away from God and his truth, our perspective becomes distorted. Everything is seen through the lens of our eyes and our lives only. We forget what God says about our circumstances, what he says about our relationship with him and about the world around us. Our perspective cannot be trusted. We need God's point of view. So having said all that, let's look into Psalm 73. And the, <clears throat> the psalm begins with Asaph uttering these words, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. We sense here that Asaph is trying to convince himself rather than others that God is good. We're sensing a, a seed of doubt here. Is this, it's as if he is saying, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are impure in heart, isn't he? Asaph has always believed that, yes, indeed, God is good to his people who are pure in heart. And pure in heart simply means people who have put their faith in God. But something has happened to Asaph to cause him to seriously reconsider his relationship with God. 
He says, but as for me, my feet almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. He's talking here about his relationship with God. Why is he thinking about turning away from God? Well, he tells us the reason is this. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Asaph has been observing those who don't know God and seeing how they live. And he doesn't like it. He describes the wicked, or the better word I like is ungodly, as being arrogant, proud, violent, callous, evil, scoffers, malicious, oppressive, and mockers of God. Yet it appears to Asaph that they are healthy, they're strong, they have no burdens or struggles, they live carefree lives, and to top it all off, they just keep getting richer and richer and wealthier and wealthier in their already prosperous lives. And these are the people who mock God and reject God, and yet they're living the kind of life that only most people could dream about. And Asaph is seriously upset by this. He has a relationship with God. He puts his trust in him. He's been faithful and obedient. He's desired to glorify and honor him. And what does he have to show for it? And this is what he says, surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been afflicted and every morning brings new punishments. The ungodly are thumbing their nose at God and they have a wonderful life to show for it. Asaph has been faithful to God and all he has to show for it is suffering and misery. This is why Asaph is on the brink of turning away from God. If a life without God brings you all these blessings, what's the point in staying faithful and suffering for your obedience? So Asaph has allowed either his suffering or the supposed carefree, prosperous life of the ungodly, or both, to mess up his perspective. But thankfully, he doesn't stay there. And thankfully, he doesn't continue in his crisis of faith. He resolves it. We read, it, we read uh, in verses 16 and 17, when I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply until I entered the sanctuary of God, and then I understood their final destiny. When Asaph finally seeks God, he gets in the presence of God. Either he gets in God's presence in the temple or the tabernacle, sorry, or, the, or through prayer, and his perspective changes and everything becomes clear. Why? Because now he sees things from God's point of view, from God's perspective, in accordance with God's truth. And that's how we who are faithful to God are to live, by his perspective. When Asaph's perspective veered away from God's perspective, it became distorted. And he looked at himself and his circumstances and the world around him through his eyes only instead of seeing life through God's perspective. And I want to look at three specific things that Asaph, Asaph sorry, uh, saw incorrectly when he was living by his own perspective instead of God's. And the first one is Asaph's understanding of suffering. It was skewed because his perspective was distorted. Asaph had a view of suffering that I think that sometimes we as Christians have today. He thought if he was faithful to God, if he checked off all the boxes, did everything he was supposed to do, then he wouldn't suffer. God would bless him and give him a great life with no suffering. And I sometimes wonder if that's not our viewpoint as well. As long as I go to church, read my Bible, pray, look at my daily devotions, give, then everything will be tickety-boo and nothing bad will happen to me. He, Asaph, and I think sometimes I think that if we're faithful, God would bless us. And that's what Asaph was thinking. But when he saw the un unfaithful living a good and apparently blessed life, it messed with his theology, so to speak. And of course, this was the same problem Job had. Job had been faithful to God, but he suffered greatly. And it's true that God had promised Israel many blessings if they remained faithful to him and his covenant. And if you, if you look at Deuteronomy 28, you'll see a long list of blessings. But the problem is, though, 
that Israel didn't remain faithful. They turned away from God and paid him lip service while worshiping idols. So what is the proper or godly perspective on suffering? Well, it is this, that God did not promise us a pain-free, trouble-free life when we follow him in, his, in this lifetime. That's the one to come. And Jesus told his disciples that if you're living in this world, you will have trouble. And he also said, the servant is not greater than the master. If Christ suffered, then we too will suffer. And actually, the New Testament tells us that our suffering glorifies Jesus, and we identify with Jesus in our suffering. So God did not say that Asaph would not suffer, nor did he say that we would not suffer. What he did say, though, is that he would never leave us nor forsake us in our suffering or anything else. And God always has a purpose in the suffering he allows us to experience. He will help us when we're suffering. He will be there with us. He'll be our strength and our guide and our wisdom as we suffer. And we know that it's in suffering that God does his greatest transformative work in us. It's through suffering that Christ-like character is more deeply ingrained in us. Our faith grows and, and we grow more spiritually mature. And oftentimes God will use us to minister to somebody else who suffers with the same type of suffering that we have been going through. So the second thing that uh, was off with Asaph's perspective was his view of the wicked or the ungodly. His distorted perspective on suffering caused him to envy the wicked. They were living the life he thought he should live because of his faithfulness to God. Now, I don't believe for a second that every unbeliever in Asaph's community were perfectly healthy, wealthy, and problem-free. There probably were a few, yes, but most likely the majority of them were no better off than Asaph. And this is what a distorted perspective does. It makes us see things that aren't real or true. So what is our attitude toward unbelievers in our communities? Do we envy them? Do we see them as scum who deserve hell? Do we think we should beat the Bible over their heads? Do we think it is right to judge them, we who have not yet reached perfection? When Asaph got God's perspective on the wicked, he came to realize that they were not to be envied, quite the contrary. Asaph writes, I understood their final destiny. Surely you placed them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly they are destroyed, completely swept away by terror. Now Asaph realizes that the wicked aren't getting away with anything. God is sovereign and he's holy and he's righteous and just and those who perish without knowing him will be eternally separated from him. The wicked are not to be envied but rather to be pitied. And I wonder as uh, for us today when we think of unbelievers do we see them as being created in the image of God? in need of the saving grace of Jesus Christ? Do we see them as people that deserve to be treated with respect and dignity because they are created in the image of God? We are to show compassion and grace to the ungodly, just as we see Jesus doing in the Gospels. We are not to live and act as they do, but rather love them with the love of Christ. We're to be a witness to them. We're to reflect of that light of God's image to them and be a beacon of hope to them. And I know from just what life is like lately that that is not an easy thing to do as followers of Jesus. Sometimes we just want to go and smack them up the side of the head and say, smarten up. But that isn't very Christ-like. But we are to be Christ to these people, and the only way we're going to be able to do that is through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit doing it through us. And it's interesting that when Asaph began to come to his senses, he was concerned for the community of faith and how his words would affect them. He said, if I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. A distorted perspective can affect not only ourselves, but also our community of faith, fellow believers, and also the 
unbelievers in our communities. Are they hearing the truth from us? Or are they just hearing our opinion? Or are they just hearing a distorted version of the truth? Asaph ends the psalm by declaring he will tell of all the deeds of God. And here again, it's uh, this idea of being a witness to who God truly is and what he's like and what his purposes are. We are to be sharers of the gospel. We are to spread the good news about Jesus to others through word and deed, and we do that with God's help. But I think if we are not living in accordance with how God would want, we, we maybe should keep our mouths shut for a while, if you know what I'm trying to say. We, our, our, our words and our, our actions need to line up. And the third and final wrong perspective of Asaph was about God. Asaph began to doubt God's goodness when he thought about his faithfulness and suffering and the supposed blessed life of the ungodly who did not suffer, or so he thought. Asaph began to think that God's goodness wasn't that good at all. If God was really good, then why was he rewarding Asaph's faithfulness with suffering? And Asaph, in his distorted perspective, was starting to think that being one of the wicked would yield a better life. He was starting to think that being one of those wicked people was starting to look good. What he was failing to see, though, was that God's goodness didn't exist to satisfy his every whim or fancy. And what is the godly perspective when it comes to God's goodness? When Asaph spent time with God and got his perspective on these issues, he said, yet I am always with you, with God. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward, you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. It is good to be near God. And here we see that Asaph finally realizes with his godly perspective that God's goodness is not about giving him whatever he wants or taking away his suffering. God's goodness is one of his attributes. It's his character, and it's shown through many of his other characters, or sorry, attributes like holiness, mercy, love, compassion, faithfulness, and patience, to name a few. God's goodness is love and grace for us when we deserve eternal judgment. God's goodness is God the Son coming to earth to live the life we should have lived and dying the death we should have died. God's goodness is his gift of salvation to us through his Son, doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. God's goodness is so many things, and it isn't about us getting what we want or him doing what we think he should do for us. For Asaph, the wicked and what they have and what they do and how they live was meaningless compared to knowing God and having a relationship with him. And he came to realize that having God and always being in his presence and knowing God's goodness through his love and his grace, his guidance, his counsel, his strength, his power and purposes was far greater than anything he thought the wicked may have or anything they were doing. Asaph came to realize that his greatest need and his greatest desire were the same thing. It was God himself. What do we need any more than God? What do we desire any more than, than God? And it's interesting as we read through this psalm that Asaph's perspective changed, but his circumstances didn't. God didn't take away his suffering, but he changed the way he saw his suffering. For Asaph's focus was now God-centered with a godly perspective. And for us today, as we seek God for his perspective and how to live in a non-Christian culture, we are able to live in this culture and remain faithful and committed to the Lord by focusing on him, not the culture. As we seek his, per his perspective on everything in our lives, including how we live in and respond to the culture, God changes our hearts and our perspectives, but the circumstances don't necessarily change. And that's why we need to focus on him. 
In Christ, we live and move and have our being, as the Apostle Paul told the Greek philosophers. And we do so with our eyes and perspectives focused on him. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we are so very thankful today that you are merciful and gracious and loving and tender and kind toward us that in Jesus Christ you have set us free from the power and the punishment of sin and given us new life in him. God, we know that in this country today there are not a huge number of believers, but you never turn your back on the believers that are here. And you are using us in this culture and you are working through us as we encounter people each day who don't know you. Lord, we thank you for your word and your truth and help us to seek you and your perspective for everything we encounter in this life, whether it's something going on in our lives or something going on in the culture. Help us to truly be a witness for you, Lord Jesus. Help us truly to be a light that shines in the darkness as you are present with us and help us to be that beacon of hope to so many people in our, in our communities who are either hopeless or have a false hope. God, we thank you that you, you teach us and you want us to be faithful. Help us to be faithful to your word. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>